evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm delighted to welcome you to the first of this year's series of readers' lectures. And we're very fortunate to have as our lecturer this evening Professor David Shanks, who's Professor of Psychology and Deputy Dean of the Faculty of Brain Sciences at UCL. The Faculty of Brain Sciences encompasses all UCL's research on neuroscience, psychiatry, psychology, and dementia. David completed his degree and PhD in psychology at Cambridge, and after a research fellowship at the University of California in San Diego, he moved to UCL in 2003, and he was head of psychology until 2017. His research includes human memory and learning, judgment and decision-making, and he's given expert evidence in court as an expert on memory, in particular on customers' recollection of the financial risk information that they were given in cases involving the alleged mis-selling of endowment mortgages. <clears throat> Professor Shank's subject this evening, memory as evidence, engages all of us who practice in the courts. We've all, whether at the bar or on the bench, and whatever our practice areas, grappled at some time with the reliability of witness recollection in cases which come to court, sometimes long after the events with which they're concerned. We may think we know what appears more reliable, but mostly we decide from what we think of as our own experience without any scientific basis or analysis. So in his lecture this evening, Professor Shanks will assist us on some of the ways in which memory can be fallible and untrustworthy, and identify the conditions and factors which render eyewitness memory most reliable. So please welcome Professor David Shanks. Deborah, thank you very much indeed. I was actually in this room just a week ago for my daughter's graduation. Um, and as a proud parent, I was, of course, rather anxious in case she stumbled across the stage. Not quite as anxious as I am now, though, addressing this uh, august audience as a humble psychologist. But I'll say a few things about uh, research in memory over the last 10 or so years, and I hope um, this will um, shed some light on the legal issues that you deal with in your, in your work. And I'm very much looking forward to your reactions to one of the main points that I want to make. And without any further ado, I'm going to uh, just preview here the, the, the two points that I, I'm going to make through the, through the talk. The first one will surprise absolutely nobody. It is that memory can be highly fragile and susceptible to distortion and easily tricked. And I'll show you, you know, one or two examples of that that are relevant you know, from, from the criminal legal domain. But then I want to spend the majority of the talk talking about the second point, which I hope you'll find a little bit more counterintuitive, perhaps a little bit more um, interesting. And this is the claim that actually eyewitness reports acquired under the right sort of conditions, I'll use this word pristine, pristine conditions, um, accompanied by high confidence, are generally extremely reliable. And I'm, I'm going to give you some, I hope, give you some convincing examples of why that claim is worth taking very seriously. And I'll show that it's true both in recall situations, like in a police interview where a witness is trying to recall um, uh, details of an incident, and also in recognition situations like a lineup, where you're trying to recognize a perpetrator from a lineup. And I'd like to just ask you to pause for a moment and think about these two points and consider what they would be like if I substituted DNA for memory in those two points. So we, we think of DNA evidence as almost like a gold standard of forensic evidence, but of course DNA evidence can be highly contaminated and inaccurate. I mean, think about the debates around DNA evidence that took place during the trial of Amanda Knox for the murder of Meredith Kircher. There was huge amounts of debate about the science behind the interpretation of tiny DNA samples. Nobody would uh, infer from instances of contamination of DNA evidence 
that DNA evidence should just be thrown out and never included in a, in a criminal case. That would be absurd. What we conclude is that we need to be very aware and have a clear articulation of what the conditions are under which that sort of evidence can be given high credibility. And that's exactly what I'm going to claim about memory. And that the, um, the strength of a memory, as indicated by the confidence with which it is asserted, is exactly a marker of robustness and credibility. So let me show you a couple of instances uh, of you know, why one might, from the outset, be rather skeptical about the robustness of eyewitness memory. I could give you many examples. I'm going to show you one uh, from a, a case study, an archival study where the ground truth is known, and another from a more naturalistic experimental um, piece of research. But I just want to make the point that uh, people are complicated, um, and we can almost never draw conclusions about something as complicated as memory from a single piece of evidence or even a single kind of evidence. So I'm going to show you uh, data through the talk that come from case studies, from laboratory experimental studies where things are very tightly controlled, and also from more naturalistic experiments. And the thing I'd like you to think about is whether you see convergence from these different sorts of evidence, because it's only really when you have clear convergence that you can uh, draw a, a reasonably strong conclusion. So here, then, is, is a case study about uh, memory, um, featuring the lady on the left, uh, Jennifer Thompson, who, in 1984, as a student in um, her college room in uh, North Carolina, was attacked and raped. Afterwards, she, um, she reported that during the attack, she had deliberately studied her attacker's face carefully, uh, thinking that were she to survive, she would do her utmost to try to identify him. And luckily, she did survive. And within a few hours, the police had put a photo lineup in front of her, uh, and she picked Ronald Cotton's face from this video lineup. Thompson asked the detective, did I do okay? And the detective replied, you did great. <clears throat> so about a week later, she identified Cotton again, marked with the arrow here, from a live lineup. The detective told her that it was the same person that she'd picked before. And finally, in the court, um, she uh, identified Cotton once again uh, as the defendant and said that she was absolutely sure that Ronald Jr. Cotton is the man. Uh, you can probably guess where this is going. He was sentenced to, uh, I think, 59 years plus life in prison. He served 10 years before being exonerated on the basis of DNA evidence. And Thompson, when she saw him, said, uh, I have never seen him before in my life. I have no idea who he is. You can see here there's a you know, very strong facial resemblance between uh, Poole, Bobby Poole, the, uh, <coughs> the true perpetrator who pleaded guilty and whose DNA was, was eventually identified, and Ronald Cotton. This story has a, a peculiar twist to the end of it because um, Thompson and Cotton actually became, remarkably, became reconciled and ultimately became very good friends. Um, they toured um, America for some time, uh, going on radio shows and TV shows, talking about uh, the need for reform of the way that eyewitness testimony was treated in American courts. And they wrote this excellent book called Pick Picking Cotton, which is about the whole um, <clears throat> incident and, and the consequent uh, conviction and eventually exoneration of Cotton. And we can see this kind of work still happening. This um, image down at the bottom here is from the Innocence Project, which is a big uh, charitable project in America which exists to try to achieve exonerations um, for people wrongfully convicted. 
Um, as of the end of last year, the Innocence Project had worked on nearly 200 cases uh, where they were able to achieve uh, exonerations based on, on DNA evidence. And the most common reason for those convictions, the original convictions in about 75% of cases was eyewitness memory. So clearly, we, we can have situations, awful, tragic situations that have, have gone awry because of false eyewitness memory. And I'm gonna come back to this case a little bit later. But before I do, I mean, obviously this is a single case, very specific uh, set of circumstances. It's very much to Cotton's um, misfortune that the police happened to be interested in, in him uh, at the time of the rape and also that he bore this strong facial resemblance to Bobby Poole. What happens when we look at other kinds of evidence? Um, we see a similar pattern, and I just want to spend a minute or two now telling you about um, a, a much bigger experiment, basically, that was done by Lorraine Hope and her colleagues to look at the memory recollections of firearms officers. So this is done as a, a large-scale sort of simulated training um, event. There's 300 firearms officers who took part in the study. They have, I think, an average of about six years of experience on the, uh, the firearms officers group. And they were exposed to a staged robbery done under extremely realistic circumstances. So they're at their base at the, um, at the military police um, residence where they're on duty. Um, a mock call comes in, they get deployed, they run out and jump into their van and they, they hurtle through the country lanes for several miles, just as they would in a real incident. They're issued with firearms and they then, uh, no doubt, wheels screeching, pull up at this uh, warehouse where a mock robbery unfolds with actors uh, following a script um, to conduct the robbery. And there's all sorts of noises of screams and alarms going off uh, of a very realistic um, incident. Their heart rate was monitored, and you know, for somebody who's in a sedentary sitting or standing position, a heart rate of 136 is quite high. This is very arousing. But these are, of course, trained firearms experts. They know that part of their job is to really be fully attentive and concentrating super carefully because human lives are at risk. And of course they know that at the end of every deployment they'll be debriefed and asked to recall as much as they can about what happened. So in the incident, the, the two perpetrators, the one on the left um, comes out of the cash office holding a shotgun and a case. Um, then there's the second perpetrator in the middle here who comes out of the office with a female hostage and shouts, um, let me go or I'll shoot her. And then you can see on the right that he um, moves away from the, from the um, hostage looking as if he's about to shoot her. And at this point, it will be obvious to the firearms officer that he or she is expected to fire. The whole incident lasts about three minutes. And then, of course, uh, they are uh, taken back to the, the home barracks and given a full debriefing and asked to remember as much as they can of the incident. So these are not ideal situations for testing the fragility of memory. Just a few seconds have elapsed since you saw those images. Can you remember the details? How many cars did you see? Perhaps you could just think about answering these questions in your head. How many cars did you see? So if I asked you to describe the two perpetrators, hat color, coat color, trousers color, shoes color, those are eight pieces of information. Would you be confident about recalling all of those? What color was perpetrator one's jacket? difficult, isn't it? It's 
It's really difficult. Can you describe the perpetrators? What shoes was a perpetrator wearing? Um, <clears throat> the firearms officers were obviously asked to identify that there were two guns involved. So can you remember what the gun was that perpetrator two was carrying? Does anybody remember? It was a, revo a, a revolver, a silver revolver. But actually, um, the firearms officers were quite poor at recalling the first perpetrator's weapon, which was actually a shotgun. What was the hostage wearing? <clears throat> was there anybody else in the background? Yes, there was a security guard, obviously, who'd been injured on the floor. Uh, where was the knife? Do you remember where the knife was? Ah, there wasn't a knife. There's a bit of suggestion there, obviously. But of course, people are incredibly suggestible under these high-stress circumstances. So what did um, the researchers find when they collated all of the, um, the reports that these 300 firearms officers um, gave? So there's two, two points here. First is that for almost everything that these firearms officers reported, they were actually accurate. Somewhere like, on average, about 93% of the things that they did report, the information that they did volunteer, was correct. If they said the person's jacket was red, then they were very likely to be correct. But the second point is the huge amounts of detail omitted from these reports. And you can see that some of these highlighted in red, the columns show on the left, correct. Incorrect means they said something that was actually false, and those numbers are relatively low. But in the column on the right, omitted. Lots and lots of details omitted. Even though they, you know, they're given a full debriefing, they're expected to recall you know, everything um, of importance in the incident. Um, for instance, if you look at the fourth row down here, it says the gun being carried by perpetrator one was broken. What that means is it was a shotgun, and it was, uh, it was broken, so the barrel is, is d pointing downwards. And, and that's really important, because it means that the weapon is actually not an immediate risk to you. But more people omitted that detail than actually reported it. And, uh, for example, further down, you can see that um, uh, only 11% were able to remember the exact wording of, of what the perpetrator shouted, 80% of people omitted reporting that piece of information. So our memories are you know, highly unreliable. Lots and lots of important information uh, gets omitted and forgotten even in a relatively short period of time. Well, <clears throat> these... Um, examples ignore what I'm going to suggest is an absolutely crucial diagnostic indicator that we need to know. We need to know something about the strength of the memory. We need to know something about the confidence with which the person is reporting it. And to go back to my, my overarching point here, I'm going to claim that notwithstanding those examples, when eyewitness memory is uncontaminated and properly tested, it is reliable in the sense that on an initial test, high confidence implies high accuracy. That will be true of both the sort of lineup situation, as in the Thompson case, and also interview situations like in the, the firearms officer's case. And I'll say a little bit about what I mean by these sort of pristine conditions where this reliability relationship holds. Um, so one of the most convincing pieces of evidence for this claim comes from uh, the following study, which was done in, in the Houston Police Department. <clears throat> um, this study was led by John Wickstead, who's a, a key contributor to the um, to work on the reliability of memory. And what he and his colleagues did was um, they spent a year in the robbery section of the Houston Police Department. This is an image on the right of the 48 robbery detectives. 
And during a whole year, the, the year was 2013, um, of all the cases that came uh, in for investigation, all that they did was to introduce, well, the main thing they did was to introduce one small modification to the routine procedure. That is, when an eyewitness was asked to make a, a to do a lineup, these are photo lineups, uh, and try to identify the, um, the suspect, they had to express their confidence. And all they did was they said it was low, me medium, or high. Okay. Now, <clears throat> having made uh, that identification, the case then continued, and later on, Wixton and his colleagues were able to go back and work out the accuracy of these identifications by looking at all the corroborating evidence that, that came alongside it. So in some of these cases, obviously, the, the perpetrator pleaded guilty, so we know that the identification was accurate. So we can now go back and we can ask, all right, how accurate are these lineup identifications as a function of the confidence with which the eyewitness um, made the identification? And <clears throat> I'm going to show you several graphs which look um, like this, an incredibly simple uh, graph showing two things. First of all, there is a huge association between confidence and accuracy. So confidence is shown on the x-axis here, going from low to high. And accuracy is shown on the y-axis, obviously going up there, sorry, it's a bit small, the print, to 100%. So the two things here, there is a relationship between confidence and accuracy. And secondly, those identifications made with high confidence are overwhelmingly correct, almost 100% correct. Okay. And we now have abundant evidence that confirms this relationship. Uh, I'll show you some other examples. Uh, so another set of data from lineup situations, this is now done with laboratory, Participants, obviously, in the laboratory, we can do this kind of experiment under very, very careful control of all sorts of extraneous factors. We don't have all the emotion and reality of a genuine criminal situation, but nonetheless, it's informative to test people's, the relationship between confidence and accuracy under these controlled conditions. And here are data averaging across 15 studies that have been done, so this is a large body of evidence, plotting again confidence along the x-axis and accuracy. The two things are highly linked, and once again, you can see that the most confident uh, identifications are almost always correct. What about when we turn from a recognition or line-up situations to recall situations, as in a police interview? We see exactly the same relationship. Here's some evidence from, this is again from witnesses to a, a crime. In this piece of research, um, Odino and colleagues in the Netherlands um, interviewed witnesses who had um, uh, been present in a supermarket during a robbery. And there were, I think, about 14 or 15, I think they were mostly staff in the supermarket who had been there while this robbery took place. And of course, there were umpteen CCTV cameras, so it was possible later to interview these witnesses and work out the accuracy of all their statements about the perpetrators, what they were wearing, who did what. Um, as a function of the confidence with which those witnesses expressed their recollections. It's not quite going up to 100% here, but even so, the high confidence recollections are accurate an overwhelming proportion of the time. And finally, you, you see that confirmed in recollections in laboratory experiments as well. This is a study by Robertson Hyam where student participants um, <clears throat> watch a, a video of a, of a bank robbery 
and are later interviewed on the details of what they can remember. And again, we see this striking relationship. Now, I, I, obviously, I'm not a lawyer. Um, <clears throat> you uh, know infinitely more than me about the nuances and the interpretation and the application of guidelines like the Turnbull Guidelines, <coughs> uh, something similar in the United States called the Biggers Criteria. And um, I just want to spend a minute then reflecting on these criteria in the light of this relationship between confidence and accuracy. These criteria seem on the face of it to be um, completely common sense. The criteria ask the, or suggest that the jury, when they're considering uh, evidence from a witness, should take into account you know, how long did the witness have the accused under observation? What were the viewing conditions like? At what distance were they viewing the, the suspect? In what light? Were they distracted? Was there a lot of uh, other things going on that would have distracted their attention? Was the observation impeded in any other way, uh, by traffic, for example? How long elapsed between the original observation and the point at which the person uh, is asked to make an identification from a lineup? Now, it seems completely reasonable that as a juror, you should take those factors into account when determining the credibility of a, a, of a witness's identification. But that's not quite the issue that we're interested in here. The issue we're interested in here is what happens when somebody is making a high confidence identification? To what extent should these factors offset our, our uh, belief in the uh, validity of that identification? And we have some evidence um, from this piece of research by Palmer and colleagues that speaks to this issue. So this is a, <coughs> a staged uh, study in which the participants in the study, who are the witnesses, um, get to observe an actor in a staged interaction. And the interaction is either going to last for a minute and a half, so it's quite a good period of time viewing the, the actor, or it's going to be very brief for five seconds. The interaction is going to happen with full attention or under conditions in which the, the witness is being distracted. And the witness is going to be asked to make an identification either immediately or after a, quite a lengthy delay, a week later. And you can see here that, first of all, uh, identifications are more accurate when the witness saw the suspect or saw the actor for a longer period of time. That's not surprising. Um, they don't do fantastically well. I mean, they should be scoring 100% correct here. It's quite a difficult... Um, I mean, the interaction is quite complicated, and they don't do brilliantly. So now I want to ask you to speculate about what you think the two numbers are going to be to the right of this. So according to the Turnbull criteria, we should take account of the viewing conditions here, uh, namely the fact that in, for some of these witnesses, they only had a glimpse of the perpetrator. So I'd like to ask a little bit of audience participation. Perhaps you could just guess for me or make an offer about what you, sort of ballpark we're going to see these two numbers um, appearing as. Anybody care to have a guess? 85 for the top one, 75. So a difference of about 10 percentage points. Any improvement on that? Yes, 90 and 90. 90 and 90. You are, Martin, you're a pessimist. The numbers are 100%, as near as makes no difference, okay? When you make a high confidence identification, that confidence completely trumps the viewing conditions. Now, of course, if you only get a glimpse of a, of a suspect, you're much less likely later on to make an identification with high confidence. But that's not what we're interested in. What we're interested in is the situation where you as a juror are hearing a witness express high confidence in their identification. 
And under those circumstances, that identification is incredibly believable, nearly 100%. The same applies under conditions of distraction. Obviously, overall, people do better in making uh, identifications when they're not distracted, but it makes no difference when um, we look at high confidence identifications. And similarly, with a delay, again, if the person is expressing high confidence, then we should factor that in appropriately and judge their identification as being um, highly credible. So now, in light of that, let's just go back and think again about um, cases like this, the Thompson and Cotton uh, <coughs> case uh, of mistaken identification. I've, um, if you were paying close attention, you'll remember that I actually described um, that Jennifer Thompson identified Cotton at least three times. First of all, within a few hours of the, of the rape, from a photo lineup, then about a week later in a, a formal live lineup, and then later still, I'm not sure how much later, but presumably weeks, if not months later, um, in the courtroom. And each time her confidence increased. But what about, so we know that in, you know, when she was in court, she was expressing incredibly high confidence about the identification. But what about the first identification? The first time she was shown the, the photo of Cotton, she spent um, uh, nearly five minutes looking at it uh, before she picked it out. And she ended by saying, I think this is the guy. Now, hindsight is a great thing. I speculate that if we went back and said, you know, on a three-point scale, low, medium to high, how would you express your confidence? I don't think she would express high confidence. And this isn't just one case. Um, we can look at um, more cases, and we can also see from these examples how the repetition of a lineup can have this really damaging effect on confidence. The more times you are asked to identify the suspect, the greater your confidence. And, and that is not a good indicator of the pristine conditions that we need. Um, Garrett um, wrote this uh, wonderful book called Convicting the Innocent. Uh, it was published, uh, I think, yeah, 2011, which is a reanalysis of a lot of these cases. And it makes very stark reading. On one level, it's, it's shocking about how eyewitness evidence has put so many people in prison. But on another more nuanced level, it tells a, a very different story. Garrett was able to demonstrate that in in practically all of the um, cases of DNA exoneration, uh, the situation deviated wildly from what we would expect today. So, for example, one of the key requirements of a pristine lineup is that the person administering the lineup uh, is blind, doesn't know who the suspect is in the lineup. Because otherwise, you know, there's subtle body language and cues that you can convey to the witness that will bias their um, identification. In many, many, many of these cases, the person administering the lineup knew who the suspect was. And <clears throat> Garrett was able to show that in every case in which it was possible to put a determination on the confidence of the initial eyewitness identification, uh, the eyewitness appropriately expressed low confidence, Thompson included. So I've given a couple of indications of, of the sort of thing that I would mean by a pristine uh, procedure. Let me just amplify that a little bit and talk about a couple of other factors that we, would, we ought to bear in mind when determining um, whether a lineup is, is pristine or not. And one of them is alcohol. Um, and I'm sure we could probably say the same thing about uh, various other drugs as well. If a witness is making an identification under conditions of intoxication, then this relationship between confidence and accuracy can no longer be taken for granted. 
And you can see that in this um, example, this study by Sauerland and colleagues, in which um, is yet another staged um, eyewitness scenario where um, an actor approaches an individual in a bar or a pub, engages uh, them in about 90 seconds of conversation, and then um, stages an emergency phone call um, they get very agitated and they have to, you know, they have to run off to go and uh, go to the hospital. And then a few seconds after that, the experimenter wanders in and goes up to this um, participant and says, actually, that was just a little staged um, event. Do you mind taking part in my experiment? Uh, and if they agree, then they have, they're given a breathalyzer and then they're given a lineup. Uh, to try to identify this person that they've just interacted with. And um, this should by now look a bit familiar. Uh, these are people with low levels of blood alcohol, and they show this nice strong relationship between um, the confidence with which they picked out um, <clears throat> the, uh, the individual from the lineup and their accuracy, again, going up to sort of 80% correct for the high confidence judgments. Uh, the cutoff here is uh, blood alcohol of 0.06. This is just, um, I think the legal limit in the US and the UK is 0 0.08. So this is a cutoff that's just a little bit lower than that. So it's about the point at which it would be illegal, for example, to, to uh, be driving a car. What happens when we look at the individuals who uh, have more alcohol in their bloodstream? we get no relationship between confidence and accuracy. So you know, here is a, a clear example of a case where we no longer have pristine conditions in terms of the, the, the state of the witness. One more example of um, pristine conditions or breaking pristine conditions just amplifies a little bit on, on something that I've already commented on about the repetition of, of lineups. Um, in laboratory research on eyewitness identification, we often compare two situations. The one on the left, this is a guilty suspect lineup, and the one on the right is an innocent suspect lineup. So this is um, a study where, you know, yet again, participants are shown a, a video of a street robbery, and then sometime later they're asked to, uh, quite soon after that, they're asked to identify the culprit. So some participants are shown the lineup here on the left, and the, the culprit from the street robbery video is shown in this lineup, is in the top right-hand position there. So obviously, if, imagine you're a participant in this experiment, you should pick the, the guilty suspect there marked by the arrow. Other participants in the experiment are shown the lineup on the right, and this is meant to simulate what would happen if the police have picked up the wrong person. So here, instead of the guilty suspect, we have an innocent suspect. But we're going to compare identifications of the guilty suspect and the innocent suspect. So participants in this experiment had one or other of these lineups. They made a selection. And then um, they <coughs> are asked to do the same thing again. But notably, what happens on the second lineup which is after a, a period of time has elapsed, is that we again have the, either the guilty suspect in the lineup for people in the, the group on the left, or we have the innocent suspect for the group on the right. But now we're going to have new foils or lures. The, the other five members of the lineup are going to be a completely new set in this second lineup. Again, this is modeling what would typically happen in a, in a police setting. You, you know, the second time you were given a lineup, it would be with different uh, lures in the lineup. So that second lineup takes place two weeks later. And this is what happens. <clears throat> so for people who saw the guilty suspect in the lineup, they were able to identify that suspect about 50% of the time, and their behavior was maintained almost identically from the first lineup to the second lineup. There's no change in their behavior. They either picked the guilty suspect or they rejected the lineup. They said, I, I don't recognize anybody. 
a tiny number of people, just 7%, picked one of the, the, the foils. But what about people who'd been, expo and who'd been exposed to an, a, a lineup with an innocent suspect? So they <coughs> picked the innocent suspect on the first occasion, 21% of the time. That's slightly worrying. More worrying than that is that the number goes up appreciably on the second lineup. What's happening here is that, the, that, that some people, that 10% of these people, they don't pick out the innocent suspect the first time. But two weeks later, when they get a lineup that features that innocent suspect again, they now think, yes, that was the, that's the perpetrator. The familiarity of that face has tricked them into thinking that that's the perpetrator. The face is familiar the second time around because it's been repeated, and that familiarity is being mistaken uh, as, as coming from the original robbery video. So any situation in which we have repetitions of lineups take us very far away from the conditions that we would regard as pristine for testing memory. So my time is running out. I just want to end with um, one last example, if I may, um, and then uh, I'd love to hear your questions. Um, psychologists, um, we love to measure and observe things, uh, and most of what I've been talking about has been observation of, of memory. But we also quite like to try to design interventions. Uh, we try to find ways of changing the world so that we can improve something, whether that's people's mental health or the way that school children learn, or the robustness of eyewitness memory. And I want you to spend a minute then telling you about um, a, a technique that has been uh, devised and studied that is intended to improve the accuracy of identification uh, memory. And this comes in a few different forms. This, this version of it is called the self-administered self interview. And basically, it's a very simple protocol here. Imagine that you're a witness to some a robbery or street crime or something like that. Um, as soon as is feasible afterwards, the attending police officer would take you aside, give you a, a copy of this questionnaire, uh, put you in a quiet place with a pen, and ask you to fill out this questionnaire. So it's an attempt to get you to access as much as you can from your memory of, of this event soon after it's happened. And there are a couple of things that I think are particularly noteworthy about the way that this questionnaire is designed. The, the first is that it contains lots of boxes with white space. And it really invites the witnesses to write down as much as they want uh, anything that they can think of that is relevant to, the, to what happened in the event. Uh, there's a sort of implication that you, know, you can't write too much here. There's bags of white space. And the second thing is that it orients the witness towards aspects that they might otherwise not think of noting. Um, so, for example, one of the pages you know, includes a sort of body. I mean, if... if there happened to be an injury in the incident, then it asks them to mark where they remember the injury taking place, who was involved. There are pages that ask about things like vehicles that might have been involved or what the weather was like, which might be of relevance. And so the, the, a witness just fills out this questionnaire. Um, and, the, and, and the issue that we're interested in is, does that affect, beneficially, their later credibility as a witness. Um, <clears throat> so here's yet another study, uh, again by the same group, um, Lorraine Hope and her colleagues, uh, again involving a, a, a staged incident, a, a video of a vehicle robbery. So one group of participants watched the, the video of the vehicle robbery, and three weeks later they were quizzed on what they could remember. And they're asked all sorts of questions like, you know, describe the clothing worn by the tallest perpetrator. They're also asked some misleading questions like, <clears throat> describe the woman with the dog. There was no woman and no dog. Um, <clears throat> these people 
score about 11 correct details uh, and about four incorrect details when they're quizzed after this three-week interval. And they, they generate a lot of confabulated false responses to the misleading questions. So that score of 3.7 means that on, for, for several of these misleading questions, they are saying something that's completely false, confabulation, like, oh yes, I think it was a little Scotch terrier. Okay. <clears throat> the other group of participants in the experiment filled out the self-administered interview immediately after watching the video. And they spent quite some time going through that, just writing down everything that they could remember. And then they come back and they do the questions as well after a three-week delay. <clears throat> they remember more than twice as much accurate, more than twice as much. This is not a small effect. This is a whopping improvement in the accuracy of correct details that are recalled. There's also fewer um, <clears throat> incorrect details recalled. And you can see at the bottom, they're also less susceptible to suggestion from misleading questions. So it's, uh, it's not surprising that this sort of protocol of administering an interview has been uh, adopted by uh, policing organizations, particularly, I think, in cases where there are quite a lot of witnesses to a particular incident and the police attending the incident you know, wouldn't be able to go around all, all the witnesses in a, in a short period of time. Um, but certainly the College of Policing and other organizations probably can't read this, but it's just an endorsement from their uh, guidelines on obtaining initial accounts from vic victims and witnesses um, urging the use of this sort of interview procedure. So I'll end by um, uh, just asking you a question, I suppose. <clears throat> I'm going to give you two quotations, and I... I'd like to ask you which you think uh, uh, is, is closer to the truth about the nuances of human memory. This is John Wickstead. Um, Eyewitness memory has been wrongfully convicted of mistakes that are better construed as having been committed by other actors in the legal system, by which he means, I think, you know, police departments, state, you know, running um, lineups which are not where the, the person running the lineup is not blind not by the eyewitnesses themselves. Eyewitnesses typically provide reliable evidence on an initial uncontaminated memory test, and this is true even for most of the wrongful convictions that were later reversed by DNA evidence. And juxtapose that with, I'm sure you'll be more familiar uh, than me with this, this is Mr. Justice Leggett's observations in the Guestman case. In everyday life, we're not aware we are not aware of the extent to which our own and other people's memories are unreliable and believe our memories to be more faithful than they are. The strength, vividness, and apparent authenticity of memories is not a reliable measure of their truth. And if anybody uh, is interested in following up on, on the sort of <coughs> experiments and points that I've been making, uh, let me just point you to this report, which is literally hot off the press. This is <clears throat> a policy document that has been uh, published just a few weeks ago as a result of a, a joint working group between the American Psychological Association and the American Legal Society, laying out <clears throat> all the reasons why, under pr pristine conditions, eyewitness memory <clears throat> can be treated as credible. Thanks very much. Um, yes, thank you very much indeed. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, my name is Julia Dias. I was just wondering, in relation to these two um, quotations, whether there's a distinction to be drawn between criminal law and civil law. Um, Mr. Justice Leggett's comment was in the context of a civil case involving a claim by one party against another for, no doubt, squillions of dollars. And of course, in civil cases, each party has a vested interest in persuading the court of its own version of events, which isn't something that you necessarily get with third-party witnesses to 
say, road traffic accidents or things like that. They have no personal mm. axe to grind. Yeah. Whereas mm. with civil litigants, there's a very powerful incentive to convince yourself that a conversation must have happened in a particular yeah. way yeah. or that a particular yeah. course of events may have happened. Yes, I mean, of course, that is an excellent point. Um, <clears throat> And uh, I, I wouldn't for one moment deny that under those conditions where one has a motivation, that can feed into and bias our recollections of the past. <clears throat> I mean, we all think that the past was better than it is uh, today, don't we? I mean, that's probably a, an illusion because uh, we remember you know, optimistic things, happy things better than we remember negative things. But I would say that there is still evidence that so I was involved uh, a while ago in a case that Deborah kindly mentioned about um, people's recollections about uh, information they'd been given about the risks associated with financial products. And of course, uh, trying to remember what a financial advisor told you 10 years ago is extremely difficult. But we do have evidence, some evidence, that, again, when those recollections are expressed with high confidence, they are more likely to be accurate. And that is true not only about financial information, but also about medical information. You might find yourself having to recall the, the possible side effects or risks that were associated with an elective surgical procedure, uh, trying to remember that many years later. You still see a relationship with confidence. Now, I... I <clears throat> We need more evidence around some of these situations, but I think that it's still quite possible that, this, uh, that the reliability is marked by this diagnostic indicator of, of confidence. Hi, could I ask you a question in relation to your use of the word confidence? Because you've used it an awful lot, and it occurs to me that certainly from a US perspective, I think a lot of what you're proposing could be potentially very dangerous. And I think that's quite a provocative thing to say to you, so I'll explain why. Effectively, you're saying that confidence should be attached to particularly high probative value, or perhaps that it is attached to high, particularly high probative value, let's say, by juries. If you take into account things like socioeconomic conditions, if you take into account, for example, the fact that police forces are often trained in terms of how to give evidence, to be very assertive, to be very confident, I think... This really needs a very, very careful assessment before any change should be made to any legal system. Because I actually think this is a recipe for restoring the sort of conclusive say of the middle class witness who says they saw it, sounds right, and is going to be believed. So I think it would be really useful if you could unpack what exactly do you mean by confidence in this particular context? Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> Interesting point, very good point. Uh, let me make it clear. <clears throat> Talking about the confidence that the witness expresses when they make an initial identification. And that confidence judgment should be made in the presence of uh, somebody administering the lineup who is blind to the, you know, not only to whether, uh, you know, who the suspect is in the lineup, but whether there's even a suspect in the lineup and <clears throat> it's not part of the case, it's not the detective leading the case, it's somebody administering the lineup. And the witness is then asked to just say, okay, you've picked out you know, person number three, do you pick them out with low, medium, or high confidence? And this relationship here, this is based on about um, 300 people in Houston making their confidence judgments under those conditions presumably from the entire breadth of socioeconomic and educational um, <clears throat> classes and so on, and yet you see that relationship. I'm not talking about the confidence with which a witness in court uh, reiterates their identification, because for the reasons that you give, I mean, I think that would not be, uh, that would not be robust. Does that answer the question? To things like income. And I think that the danger here is, I mean, I think you're saying you would need a lot of extra resources, but this is the sort of academic thinking that might get taken up by a particularly right-wing system, not have the actual underpinnings that you're talking about in terms of 
the disconnected, disinterested people, although I think there's a big question mark about what confidence means across socioeconomic groups. But the result then is you get aggressive prosecutors who will actually misuse, if you like, the science. Now, I'm not saying for one minute what you're doing isn't extremely interesting, but I would have thought that in the hands of the wrong people, particularly in a system like the United States, this is actually something that you would need to think about extremely carefully. But let's go back to, you know, one, two, three, how, how confident you are. I mean, you need to be very confident that you get uniform levels of confidence, all, less beneath, all things been equal, across different socioeconomic groups. You'd really have to be really sure of that. Is that, the, is that evidence there, I wonder? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the calibration of confidence with accuracy is pretty immune to those sorts of variables. It doesn't vary with education level. But ultimately, I mean, I take your point uh, insofar as... You're, in, in, a, in a criminal situation, you're only getting one response from your witness. I mean, what did they express? They either said, I have low confidence or medium confidence or high confidence. And of course, there's, people are different. Somebody, uh, for, for one person, high confidence might be medium confidence for another person. But the point is that if the initial identification was made with anything other than high confidence, that should be taken into account in the, in the, uh, by the jury, and, and the, the identification should then not be given great weight. Any other questions? Over here, thank you. Uh, thank you. Does your research show um, a distinction in recalling uh, faces and identifying people versus recalling uh, events um, and sequences of events? Uh, yes, very much so. Um, uh, faces are particularly memorable and of course they have all sorts of attributes that can make them more memorable, actually can make them less memorable. People tend to remember faces from their own race much better than other race faces, for instance. Distinguishing features on faces make them highly memorable. I mean, faces are a very, very, very particular kind of thing. And um, the, the aspects of other sorts of events that we remember, depending on their emotionality and so on, also determine uh, their memorability. So, yeah, faces are, uh, just because you see these relationships that I've talked about in regard to faces, that doesn't mean you could necessarily generalize that to everything else, although I have shown you that you see the same relationship for all kinds of details of recollection. Yes, last question. Any more questions? Yes, over the far side, thank you. <clears throat> How close are we then to having self-administered interviews becoming a reality um, in practice? Well, I think they are a reality in practice. I mean, the, the, it, uh, there are cases where they have been used. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They have been administered in uh, witness situations. I believe so, yeah. Now, well, you'll be more expert than me on, on what the, the legal si system's attitude would be to, in, the, in the court if that came up as a practice that had been administered. But it's my understanding that they have been, yeah. Well, thank you, David, very much for a really thought-provoking uh, lecture this evening. I think that for those of us who direct juries every day, that a convinced witness may still be a mistaken witness, I think you've given us some food for thought. I think that from what you've said, perhaps the uh, mistaken witness, the convinced witness, is the witness who's giving evidence in court rather than right at the very beginning when they're making an identification, for example. But I have to confess to coming into the 2% of people who make a wrong identification in a very confident way. <laughs> because as somebody who was so confident about her powers of identification that I shouted my husband's name 
at a television presenter in a hotel foyer in Edinburgh and was still so confident that I was undeterred by his indifference that I walked up and tapped him on the shoulder. I think I fall firmly into your 2%. But thank you very much. <laughs>